think uh, Will does not need much of an introduction. I will just say I think he's done um, exceptional work in the area of migrants and minorities and how to address challenges of culture and religious diversity, starting with his 1995 book on multicultural citizenship, and ever since authoring and editing several books and organizing conferences on the different um, aspects of these topics and researching them not only in North America, Australia, or Europe, but also including um, thinking about how these questions are addressed in Asia or in Central Eastern Europe. Um, and today he will be tackling, I think, a, a still very hot topic, which is how to go, to go beyond uh, neoliberal, neoliberalism um, and how to go beyond welfare sovereignism and still address multicultural challenges. So, Will, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna, for that uh, kind introduction and, and for the invitation to be here. It's, it's always great to be at the EUI. So I have for many years been defending multiculturalism and primarily doing so on a normative basis. That is, I, I think that uh, people have legitimate interests in their, their language, their culture, their identity, and that a fair accommodation of those interests requires a range of multicultural accommodations and minority rights. Uh, and I continue to, to defend that normative argument. But uh, one response I often get is that even if multiculturalism is defensible uh, in principle, that it, it has some perverse effects in practice. And a number of uh, arguments have been made about these potential perverse effects. But I want to focus tonight on one of them, the one I'm currently trying to research, which is the potential effect of multiculturalism on national solidarity. So the, the, the basic thought is that multiculturalism involves um, recognizing, highlighting, uh, entrenching uh, perceptions of difference and diversity, and that the more that a society and a state uh, recognizes and, and perpetuates uh, and renders salient diversity, the harder it is to sustain a sense of common identity, of shared fate, a, a sense of solidarity that may be needed for the welfare state. And this is thought to create what is sometimes called a progressive's dilemma, that progressives want to, to uh, ensure justice for, for immigrants by uh, accommodating diversity, but this may come at expense of the ability of society to sustain a, a robust redistributive welfare state. Um, so that's a concern that, that I, I have um, been interested in and uh, wanting to better understand what is the nature of that uh, dilemma, if, if it is a real dilemma, and how we might avoid it. M my experience has been that many of my uh, progressive colleagues uh, think that, that we, that it, that it, uh, this whole anxiety uh, around the impact of diversity on solidarity is uh, unhelpful. Um, and that it really um, only arises because some people are in the grip of a kind of um, nationalist idiom or ideology so that they, they uh, you know, operate with, if you like, a kind of methodological nationalism so that they assume that the nation is always already integrated, coherent, solidaristic, um, and that immigrants are this unnatural disturbance into uh, the, the national container that's otherwise uh, integrated and solidaristic, um, when in fact we know that nations are not uh, uh, particularly cohesive or well integrated and, and that the lines of identity and, and, and uh, loyalty and, and affiliation are multiple and complex. Um, and so the idea that the, the nation for, uh, always already forms a clear we that might be eroded by the introduction of they, the immigrants, is already to look at the world in a kind of uh, distinctly nationalist idiom. Um, and that when social scientists pursue this issue, they can be seen as kind of just mirroring uh, or, or indeed legitimating that kind of um, nation building uh, framework um, and so and so some of my colleagues think that we should we shouldn 't really give much credence to this progressive this alleged progressive dilemma um, but i 'm still quite interested in it, um, partly because even if even if that sort of nationalist um, idiom uh, is a myth uh, uh, 
uh, it's nonetheless a powerful myth and that state actors invest quite a lot of time and energy in diffusing it in our societies, uh, in trying to encourage everyone who lives within the container, the national container, to think of themselves as a we, uh, and therefore inevitably to think of, of immigrants as a they. So, so that's, a, that's a powerful mental framework, and uh, since it's pervasive in our, in our world, I think we need to think about what is the impact of multiculturalism on it. But I also think, and more controversially, that I, perhaps I, I think that, that governments, uh, it's, a legitimate, it's legitimate for governments to try to promote that kind of national identity. That it's, I think it's a permissible uh, goal of the state to try to encourage the residents of, of nation states to think of themselves as forming a we, uh, belonging together. Um, and as having forms of shared national identity and solidarity. Uh, and that indeed, uh, there may be some, some requirements of social justice that are, impossible, that are very difficult to achieve unless uh, states actively engage in this kind of nation building. So what I want to do in the paper basically is give a, a couple of reasons, I want to start by giving a couple of reasons why I think uh, nation building of this sort uh, is it can be a progressive political project uh, and why we shouldn't uh, uh, dismiss the possibility that nation building can serve progressive political ends uh, and then try to explain how respect for diversity and multiculturalism can nonetheless be consistent with that and so that we can have a, a, a form of multicultural or inclusive national solidarity. Okay, so the f first part then is why, why might nationhood, why might the pursuit, the diffusion of nationhood be a progressive political project? So th this is, there's a large literature on, on normative theories of, of nationhood. Uh, lots of arguments have been given. Let me just mention two. So one is uh, about the requirements of democratic st stability. So some people think that if everyone believes in democracy, then democracy will be stable. But uh, the fact that everyone shares a commitment to democracy doesn't yet tell us anything about the units within which democracy is enacted. So just think about the continent of Europe. Let's imagine, ex hypothesi, that everyone on the continent of Europe is a fervent believer in democratic principles. That doesn't yet tell us, should there be one, country, one state in Europe, 28 states in Europe, 280 states in Europe? It doesn't tell us anything about the boundaries of these uh, units should they be drawn just uh, latitude and you know just grid lines on a map, or should they follow topographical features of areas of historic settlement? And th we can't we can't get democracy off the ground unless we have at least some temporary consensus on the units within which democracy will operate. So democracy, in order to get democracy off the ground, we must have at least some temporary converging preferences about units. But there's absolutely nothing in democratic theory that entitles us to the assumption that people will have converging preferences about the units of democratic governance. On the contrary, everything in democratic theory should incline us to expect that people will have diverging preferences about that, because after all, it's a starting point of democratic theory that people have diverging preferences. That's why we need democracy. People, we should expect people to have diverging preferences as a result of dif different interests, different historical experiences, different ideologies, religions, faiths. These are the facts of pluralism. If you think about it, all of those are also prima facie reasons to expect people to have diverging preferences about the units of government. And if that were true, if, 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 preferences about the units of government diverged as much as preferences about public policy, we would be in trouble. So what explains why we do have this? So we, democracy needs this kind of puzzling combination of irreducible plurality and diverging preferences on policy combined with converging preferences about the unit. What makes that possible? Well, I would say in the modern world, the, a large part of that answer is nationhood. Nationhood has helped to... Um, has helped to secure the, the converging preferences about units. Because after all, nationhood, in a sense, just is an ideology about the units of government. Na nationhood is, is, is where states have successfully diffused uh, ideas of, of nationhood, that gives people the sense that they belong together in a shared political unit. That's part of what nationhood is, is the desire to, that it's right and proper that we all, we all belong together in a single political unit. Nationhood involves a commitment to the idea of collective agency. It's right and proper that we govern collectively together. 
And nationhood also involves the idea of an attachment to territory, attachment to the, to the national patrimony. So nationhood is precisely a way of trying to shape converging preferences on units of government. And I think that helps explain in large part why democracy has in fact had the stability it has had uh, in, in, uh, in Europe. So that's one function of nationhood. A another function of nationhood is, and more directly relevant for this talk, is about solidarity. So nationhood, the sense that we, the, that we form a nation may be, may be needed to help sustain a redistributive welfare state. Now I should immediately emphasize, I don't believe for a second that humans only care for others who are one of them, who belong, so that it, shared nationhood is not necessary for us to have a moral concern for other people. We're not, as a species, we're not psychopaths. So if we see someone in distress, we don't ask, are they a co-national? I, I mean, if someone is in distress, someone is in need, we, we have moral propensities, moral dispositions to show concern. And that can underpin, we have throughout history, we can see uh, dispositions towards duties of rescue when people are in distress, the duties to relieve suffering, duties of hospitality, say for refugees. So all of those, I don't think, depend on nationhood those humanitarian uh, moral responses. But I think the welfare state is not about a humanitarian response to distress or suffering. The welfare state is about constructing a certain kind of community. It's an ethic of community membership. It's about what kind of community do we want to build? What kind of social relations do we want to have with each other? So one way to think of it is that duties to strangers are humanitarian. They're a, they're a direct response to the human need of the other unmediated by ideas of national identity. But the welfare state is an ethic of community membership and it's about trying to construct, it's, a, it's egalitarian rather than humanitarian. It's about trying to create certain kinds of social relations amongst the members of the community. Now, the idea that, and I think that nationhood has helped us to generate that sense of community, uh, uh, community ethic, ethic of community membership. The, the idea that solidarity is needed for the welfare state is controversial. Uh, if you read the liter literature on the welfare state, the dominant uh, theory for explaining the welfare state is called power resources theory, which is essentially says that the, the, the welfare state is the result of strategic bargaining between those actors who want a stronger welfare state, those who, who don't, and it's just, and they're all, both of whom are acting on the basis of self-interest, and uh, the outcome depends on who has more power. And so if in a society you have strong labor unions or strong social democratic parties, you'll get a stronger welfare state than in societies with weaker unions or weaker social democratic parties, but that's all just about self-interested strategic bargaining between people who have different self-interest and has not, no one is assumed to act on the basis of solidarity. I, so, so that's a credible alternative explanation. It, so maybe, maybe solidarity has nothing to do with the welfare state. But, and it's interesting, I think, that the, the left itself historically used to think that way. So if you go back 100 years, social democratic parties described themselves as class parties representing the interests of a particular class in class struggle against their class enemy. And the struggle for the welfare state was understood as, as part of the class struggle against a class enemy. The, but the real dramatic change in social democracy in the 20th century was when social democratic parties changed their self-identity from being a class party to being a people's party, which uh, expressed themselves as representing the interests of the people, not, not of a class, but of the people, and as trying to articulate the ethical obligations that we have to each other as members of a people. Right? So this is the origin of Swedish social democrats, the idea of the people's home, but it's also uh, underpinning T.H. Marshall's famous passage. Let me just quote it. I'm sure you've all heard this a hundred times, but Marshall said that the welfare state rests on, I'm quoting, a direct sense of community membership based on loyalty to a civilization that is a common possession. So both for the Swedish Social Democrats and the British Labour Party, the idea is that the welfare state is about membership in a community and the, the function of the welfare state is to enable people to belong to a community, to participate in it, to enjoy its fruits, to feel a sense of loyalty and attachment to it. Um, 
so that they belong to the community and the community belongs to them. So in other words, for, for, the social, for social democrats in the 20th century, the welfare state is an expression of, of national solidarity, not just, not only, or primarily of either class struggle or universal humanitarianism. And I think that's had a powerful influence on the development of the welfare state, uh, is this shift from thinking of it as purely self-interested class struggle to, to an expression of, of national solidarity. Okay, so those are two reasons why, and I, I could go, if we had more time, I'd, I'd, I would try to make other arguments, but why nationhood can be politically progressive. I think it helps to stabilize units of democracy, and I think it helps to sustain an ethic of community membership that, that underpins a redistributive welfare state beyond humanitarian relief of suffering. I, I should immediately say that I don't believe that nationhood is the only possible basis for stabilizing democracy or for sustaining uh, solidarity. And on the contrary, I mean, I think it's one of the important tasks of political theory to try to imagine what are alternative ways of organizing political community that don't rely on nationhood. And so I, I, I welcome my colleagues in political theory who are building, trying to construct theories of post-national democracy, cosmopolitan democracy, or say ecological democracy, or or agonistic democracy, all, 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 all of it, so, you know, Connolly and, and, and uh, agonistic or, or Benevieve and, and Habermas for post-national democracy, all of which are trying to think about ways of stabilizing democracy and, and building solidarity without relying on nationhood. I think that's an important political project, important intellectual project. All I'd say is that in determining the success of those projects, we need to take seriously these issues about democratic stability and solidarity. And so, for example, we need to ask, what is the, what is the explanation for this puzzling combination of diverging preferences over policy but converging preferences of the, over the units? Because democracy won't work unless we have that. And so we need to ask people like Habermas and Benaby and Connolly, what, what is their explanation for, for that combination? What is it that, stable, that, that helps to ensure cons, converging preferences about the units of government. And I th it's clear that they presuppose that there are converging preferences about the units, but I think they give us no explanation of why that we should expect that convergence. And if we scratch the surface, I would argue that they are in fact relying on nationhood. They're, it's not, they, explicitly they deny they're relying on nationhood, implicitly they in fact rely on nationhood to explain the converging preferences over units. But since they don't acknowledge it, they then also don't acknowledge the ways in which uh, their reliance on nationhood can disadvantage minorities. Okay, so, uh, but in any event, for the foreseeable, so it, I think that's an unresolved, that's, that's an ongoing project in political theories to try to imagine other forms of political community that don't rely on nationhood. But I think for the foreseeable future, our world is constructed around nationhood, and so we need to think about this potential progressive dilemma. So, 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 our society does rely on nationhood, I think, for democratic stability and for solidarity, but we know, and this really has been the focus of my own work, we know that that's come at a huge cost. This reliance on nationhood has come at a huge cost for those people who don't fit the definition of the nation, and that, that could be indigenous peoples, it could be historic regional groups like the Catalans and the Basques, or, or of course it could be immigrants and refugees. Uh, all of whom are, are seen as other and alien and therefore not entitled to, to be part of the collective self-government and who are therefore excluded or assimilated or, or even worse, subject to, to expulsion and, or genocide. So we know that there's been huge historic costs to the reliance on nationhood. And that's why I think that the only morally legitimate form of nation building is one that has to be qualified and supplemented with very robust forms of multiculturalism and minority rights and indigenous rights. And that's, as I said, been the focus of my own work is to try to elaborate what are the forms of multiculturalism and minority rights and indigenous rights that help to protect minorities from the chronic risk that nationhood uh, imposes on them. And so I've, yeah, so I've tried to develop ideas about how, uh, about how we can uh, supplement and qualify nation building with, with uh, multiculturalism and minority rights. But that just raises again the potential progressive dilemma that maybe these forms of multiculturalism and minority rights that help protect minorities are eroding the sense of nationhood that underpins uh, solidarity. 
Okay, so, so as I say, I think we can't, we, I, I, my, my sense is we can't, we can't evade the concern, we can't evade the question about how, how diversity is impacting on solidarity. And I think it's a particularly a, 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 a salient concern because uh, if you think about it historically, you could, you, one could argue, some people have argued, that the rise of multiculturalism has uh, coincided with the rise of neoliberalism, and the two have, at least uh, it, in many people's eyes, have kind of gone hand in hand. Uh, and so the people, so it looks like, in a kind of broad historical sweep, that the rise of multiculturalism has gone hand in hand with a period, an epoch in which we are diminishing the welfare state. And so it's a legitimate question to ask, what's the relationship between those two? And in fact, it was some of the same organizations, international organizations that were pushing neoliberalism, like the World Bank, the OECD, even the European Union for a while, that were also pushing multiculturalism. So, you know, the, the 1980s and early 1990s were the kind of heyday of neoliberalism, the kind of market fundamentalism, Thatcher, Reagan, and so on. That was also the heyday of multiculturalism. And some of the same international organizations were pushing both at the same time. And so I think many people experienced multiculturalism as the kind of flip side of neoliberalism. Or another way to think of it is, people were being told to extend, to welcome diversity, to welcome immigrants, uh, to include them in the community. But at the same time, they were told to kind of gut the, the ethic of community that they had inherited through the welfare state. They were told to cut social spending, to, to reduce social protections, or to put another way, they were told to extend equality to immigrants, but the meaning of equality was being eroded uh, uh, as a result of neoliberal reforms. And so I think, so many people, I think, kind of experienced multiculturalism as, as I say, the flip side of, of neoliberalism, as part and parcel of a broader trend that, that eroded solidarity. Uh, that, that link between multiculturalism and neoliberalism was so powerful for a while uh, in, in the 1990s, late 80s and early 1990s, that some people have assumed that, neo, that multiculturalism was always just a neoliberal ploy. So uh, Zizek is an example, a famous article in which he argues that multiculturalism it, uh, was, was, it was designed by neoliberals. Um, I, I think that is demonstrably false. We, that, that multiculturalism first emerged in the Western democracies in the 1960s and 70s, well before the era of, of neoliberalism, and it, it emerged under the, the guidance of social democratic parties as part of a larger welfare state agenda, uh, rather than as a result of neoliberalism. So the original forms of multiculturalism in the Western democracies were social democratic and were part of the welfare state. And just for that reason, the initial reaction of neoliberals to, the, to multiculturalism was very negative. So think about Thatcher, think about Reagan. They were both scathing about multiculturalism, which they viewed as the epitome of the problems of the welfare state. They viewed multiculturalism as just a, the kind of paradigm example of what's wrong with the welfare state, the nanny state. Uh, but it's interesting that over time, through the 80s and into the 90s, some neoliberals, and the World Bank would be an interesting test case, decided to make peace with multiculturalism. And, uh, that rather than attacking it directly, they instead kind of transformed it. But the way in which they transformed it was by, in my view, gutting it of its kind of progressive emancipatory focus on redressing disadvantage uh, of, of racial and other minorities, and instead focusing on the way in which ethnicity can be, a sort, can be a market asset. So the neoliberal conception of multiculturalism is that ethnicity can be a, a market asset. And we should support ethnicity insofar as it enables people to be competent market actors. Why would, so, and why is ethnicity a market asset? Well, in some cases you can just directly commodify your cultural difference. You can, you can, you know, cuisine, clothing, music, you can just commodify cultural difference on the marketplace and try to, and, but it's also seen as a market asset more indirectly. So many neoliberals in the World Bank did a lot of this, argued that ethnic ties are sources of social capital. And so if people can draw on their ethnic ties to position themselves to be more competitive in a global marketplace. They can take advantage of transnational ties. Ethnicity builds trust, blah, 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 blah. blah. So, 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 so we had in, in the late 80s and early 1990s this, this powerful 
uh, development of a kind of neoliberal conception of multiculturalism, which is it was not the original multiculturalism, but, but in, in some times and places displaced the earlier social democratic model of multiculturalism. And, th and that's what people experienced. So I think many people's experience of multiculturalism is of this, in my view, kind of emaciated neoliberal form. And so not surprisingly, they reacted against it, and they reacted against neoliberal multiculturalism so, so, so neoliberal multiculturalism, to, just to summarize, we could view as inclusion without solidarity, right? So neoliberal multiculturalism says, let's include immigrants, but there's no solidarity attached to inclusion because it's... Uh, so, so, so many citizens re re reacted negatively to that and defended solidarity, but they defended solidarity in the name of a narrowly defined nation. And so they defended solidarity, but they defended solidarity against immigrants. And so we've seen the development of welfare chauvinism. So people mobilized to defend the welfare state, but they defended in part by trying to keep immigrants out. And so we've seen a, a development of a whole series of public policies which, make, which put increased waiting times before immigrants gain access to the welfare state or make a, a whole range of conditions. So you need to pass language, you have to take language classes or pass tests and so on in order to qualify for the welfare state. So in other words, we have solidarity without inclusion. So, so in, 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 so I mean, this is obviously ridiculously oversimplified, but in, 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 some, in some times and places, there was this kind of, if you like, stark choice between a neoliberal multiculturalism that was inclusion without solidarity, and then a welfare chauvinism, which defended solidarity without inclusion. Okay, so my normative preference is for a third option, which is inclusive solidarity, a multicultural solidarity. So that's normatively attractive, I hope. I, I find it attractive, I hope most of you do. The question is, is it realistic? Is it possible to have an inclusive multicultural national solidarity? So that's, that's what I've been trying to struggle through. And I have found, to my surprise, that we actually don't know much about, that there's surprisingly little written about the sources and preconditions of an inclusive solidarity. So part of the reason why there's not much written is that the welfare state literature is dominated by this power resources theory, which assumes that everyone acts on the basis of self-interest, so they're just not interested in solidarity as a phenomenon. It just, it's, it's invisible within standard theories of welfare state based on power resources theory. But I think that's just a symptom of a much more general trend, which I, which I have found surprising and interesting, which is in so social sciences generally have paid very little attention to the idea of solidarity. Uh, I, in, in the paper, I cite a whole number of people noting how little has been written about the idea of solidarity. So part of the, I think part of what's going on is people view solidarity as simply a, it's a, cheap, it's a cheap rhetorical term that politicians use, but not something that's deserving of serious uh, academic study. Uh, but part of, the, part of the issue is that most of our reigning social theories have no space for solidarity. So at least this is Jeffrey Alexander's explanation. So I'm just going to read you this quote from Jeffrey Alexander, which I, which I find interesting. He says, solidarity is a central dimension of social order and social conflict, yet it has been largely absent from influential theories of modern society. Most of the big thinkers, classical, modern, and contemporary, have conceived prototypically modern relationships as either vertical or atomized. Modernization is thought to have smashed effectual and moral, fe moral fellow feeling because of commodification and capitalist hierarchy in the case of Marx, because of bureaucracy and individualistic asceticism in the case of Weber, because of the growing abstraction and impersonality of the collective consciousness uh, in the case of Durkheim, or post-modernity is typically seen as liquefying social ties and intensifying narcissistic individualism, in the case of Bauman, or as creating new forms of verticality, for example, the disciplinary cage, in the case of Foucault. And so he sums up and he says, in short, much of contemporary social theory has tried to make solidarity disappear. And I actually, it's an interesting comment on, on the state of social theory and social sciences generally, is that there's surprisingly little attention paid to uh, the, the, the nature and sources of, of an inclusive solidarity. So, so given that, so there's not much to go on. Uh, so what I'm about to say is just preliminary and speculative, so yeah, for what it's worth. But let me start with some good news. We do know, I think, I think it's now clear, that there's no simple 
uh, zero-sum relationship between multiculturalism and solidarity. This we have, I think, some reasonable empirical evidence on, that those countries that have gone farther down the path of adopting multiculturalism policies or minority rights or indigenous rights have not had a more difficult time sustaining the welfare state over the past 30 years than those countries that rejected multiculturalism, like France or, or Greece or <clears throat> Germany. So, I mean, you, you know, you can, you can plot countries on, on a scale in terms of the extent to which they've embraced multiculturalism policies, and there's simply no correlation between where they're plotted in terms of their commitment to multiculturalism and uh, the evolution of their welfare state. So whatever the relationship it is between multiculturalism and the welfare state, it's not hydraulic. It's not like the more you have multiculturalism, the less you have of of either social spending or of public support for uh, social spending. So that's the good news, but, and, and I, I think it's an important piece of good news, but it's limited, I think, in, for, for a variety of reasons. I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting statistical result, but there's probably, there's likely to be places in which, the, in more specific contexts in which the two come into conflict. And more generally, I would say, all that statistical evidence shows is that at the relatively modest levels of multiculturalism we currently have, there's been no conflict with the relatively modest levels of redistribution we have. But I'm, I, I, as a progressive, I would like to have more of both. I would like to have more multiculturalism and more redistribution. And the statistical evidence we have to date doesn't provide us with any clear basis for predicting what will be the impact of that. If we try to ratchet up both multiculturalism and redistribution, will, will a conflict emerge? So I would feel much more comfortable if we knew more about what are the dynamics that sustain an inclusive solidarity. And so just to, to at least start that conversation, let me go back to the case of neoliberalism because I, I think we might be able to learn something from it. So neoliberalism is why the, the, the neoliberal era, so let's say 1980 to 1996 is a kind of heyday of market fundamentalism, the Washington consensus and so on. So many people view that as the kind of, it's widely seen as a classic, as an important instance of the decline of solidarity. So what explains the decline of solidarity during the, the, the neoliberal heyday? So I've just said it's not multiculturalism. There's no correlation between the extent to which a country adopted multiculturalism policies and how it fared in terms of welfare state over the, that period. So what, what, what was going on in the, the period of, of neoliberalism? Was there a drop in solidarity? And if so, what explains it? So I think one, one, one answer is that actually there wasn't at the level of public attitudes any significant drop in solidarity. So depending on how you measure it, people's attitudes People's commitment to the principles of the welfare state have been remarkably stable through the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s. I mean, there's been, depending on how you ask the question, like, if the question is, do you believe that it's an important task of the, of the state uh, to, to, uh, to reduce inequalities, people are just as likely to say it today as they were 10, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, do you believe it's permissible or appropriate to tax the rich to help the less well off? Phrased in these general, general ways, support for the welfare state is remarkably stable. Many, many commentators have, have noted how the stability of popular commitment to the welfare state. So whatever happening with, with during the era of the neoliberalism, it doesn't seem to have been rooted in any great change in public attitudes towards uh, the legitimate functions of the welfare state. So that's sort of good news. But if we dig a little deeper, something interesting emerges, which is that although people's general attitudes to the welfare state have been stable, their attitudes towards particular recipients have, har have harshened, have become harder. So if you, if you ask instead, not general questions about do you support the, the welfare state, but do you think that this particular group, say single mothers, are deserving of uh, this or that uh, uh, social protection, people's attitudes have become harsher, more judgmental. Uh, that's true about single mothers, that's true about the unemployed, it's true about people with disabilities, and it's true about immigrants. So these are often called deservingness judgments. So what, one crude way to think of it is, you know, the, the, old, the old welfare state, let's say, was based on the hunch, based on the, you know, that the, the rich didn't really deserve to be as well off as they are, the poor don't really deserve to be as well, off, as badly off as they are, and so the welfare state, uh, uh, you know, redresses that, th those injustices. People still think that the well-off don't deserve their advantages, but they started to think that some of the less well-off maybe do deserve to be less well-off. So we've become harsher in our judgments about beneficiaries. Okay, what explains these deservingness judgments? 
that, because that seems to be where the action is. It's not general attitudes towards the welfare state, it's attitudes towards particular beneficiary groups. We have harsher deservingness judgments. <laughs> so it looks like these deservingness judgments are an amalgam of a variety of things. Uh, beliefs about whether the recipients had voluntary control over their fate. Could they have chosen otherwise? And was it, could they have done something to escape their disadvantage? It's, but it's also connected to uh, judgments about identity. Are they a member of our community or are they a stranger? Uh, so are they, do they fall under the rubric of an ethic of community membership or do they fall under the ethic of obligations to strangers? Uh, there's also uh, judgments about attitude. Do the recipients, when they, when they receive social benefits, do they receive them in the spirit of civic friendship? So again, Marshall views the welfare state as an expression of civic friendship. Do the recipients accept the welfare state benefits in the spirit of civic friendship? Or do they instead uh, 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 take those benefits with feelings of hostility and alienation and uh, so on? And, and then finally, reciprocity. Uh, do we think that those people who currently need benefits, will they reciprocate when they're better off and we're worse off? Can we, ca can we count on them to reciprocate when the circumstances are different? Okay, so these, these, are, these are some of the, the, the components of deservingness judgment. Control, identity, uh, attitude, and reciprocity. And I just want to flag that all of these are, I think, evidence of my earlier claim that support for the welfare state is tied to an ethic of community membership. Those are all four dimensions of community membership. And people care about whether the welfare state is part of this ethic of community membership. And they become much less supportive when it's divorced from that. If the, if the welfare state was about universal humanitarianism or just about class struggle, these deservingness judgments would not, be, would not be so pervasive. But these deservingness judgments arise precisely because people understand the welfare state as an expression of an ethic of community membership. And these are four dimensions of asking, is it working as an ethic of community membership? Okay, so the result is that the empirical evidence shows that many beneficiaries are suffering from the, these deservingness judgments, including single mothers and, and the unemployed, but especially immigrants. Immigrants are indeed the most likely to be penalized by these deservingness judgments. Uh, Van Orschot has said that this is a, he calls it a truly universal feature of, what, of attitudes towards the welfare state across all the Western democracies. Every single Western democracy Immigrants are at the bottom of the deservingness ladder. Okay, and that's why I think we have so much welfare chauvinism, is because uh, immigrants are seen as falling at the bottom of these deservingness judgments that are tied to an ethic of community membership. So what do we do about it? If that's the explanation, if that's why, the, that's why we have a failure of inclusive solidarity, that's my tentative explanation for why we have failures of inclusive solidarity, is because immigrants are falling at the bottom of these deservingness judgments. Okay, what do we do about that? So, one option is we just wait until immigrants can muscle their way into the welfare state because sooner or later they're going to get the vote and then, and then, and then we'll rely on power resources theory. We don't, we're not going to try to change people's deserving judgments. We're just going to wait until immigrants have enough voting power that they can vote their way in. That's one possibility. Another possibility is to try to persuade people to stop thinking of the welfare state in terms of an ethic of community membership and instead think of it in terms of universal humanitarianism. And then these deserving judgments would not be nearly as pronounced. So both of those strategies just try to avoid the challenge of national solidarity, try to find ways of dealing with this problem without changing people's, uh, uh, without relying on appeals to national solidarity. But as I've said, I think we can't avoid, I think national solidarity matters, it matters for the welfare state, and so we need to, ta we need to ask, is there a way of changing judgments about immigrants uh, uh, in a way that makes them fit with these uh, ideas and practices of national solidarity? So, um, um, so how would we do that? So, uh, um, so I'm running out of time. So let me just try to um, how how we how we try to deal with this problem will depend in part on how much we think the problem. Uh, so, wh why are immigrants at the bottom of the deservingness ladder? It, that, how we respond to that will depend on whether, do we think that they're at the bottom of the deservingness ladder primarily because of perceptions of economic threat 
or economic burden, that people put them at the bottom of the deservingness ladder because we're worried that immigrants are free riders uh, who are an economic burden and that's why they're at the bottom? Or is it because we view immigrants as a cultural threat uh, and, and that their, their cultural otherness is a threat to community membership? So how much of it is about economic threat? How much of it is about cultural threat? If it's purely economic threat, then we could try to deal with these harsh deservingness judgments by perhaps, for example, restructuring the welfare state so that it relies less on means-tested benefits and more on universalistic benefits because we have very good evidence that universalistic welfare states are less likely to prompt these harsh deservingness judgments. That's a reasonably robust finding. Universalistic welfare states are less likely to prime these deservingness judgments, whereas if you have means-tested programs, it, it gives people more opportunities to engage in these kinds of moralistic deservingness judgments. So we could tinker with the welfare state to try to diminish deservingness judgments, or of course we could just try to increase labor activation and, and uh, so on in order to make it, to reduce the perception that immigrants are an economic burden. My own view, for what it's worth, is that the real problem isn't perceptions of economic threat. I think the real issue is perceptions of cultural threat. There's a lot, uh, there's a lot of, that's controversial, but there's a lot of evidence we could talk about. For one piece of evidence I think is interesting is that if you ask people, most people in Europe, whether you would prefer to have a small number of immigrants who are an economic burden, or a large number of immigrants who will be economic net economic contributors to the welfare state, the overwhelming majority of people would have would prefer to have a smaller number of immigrants who are an economic burden than a larger number of immigrants who are economic contributors because they care more about their cultural threat than about economic threat. Another piece of evidence is who, who are the people in society who are most opposed to immigrants? The elderly, the pensioners. They, do, they are not, they, 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 so they're the ones who are most inclined, but they have the least economic, they're not economically threatened by immigrants. They're no longer in the workplace. They, they, they're, not, they're not competing with immigrants for jobs. On the contrary, working age immigrants are helping to keep their pensions uh, sustainable. So, but they feel culturally threatened. The, the, so the most powerful opposition to immigrants comes from the elderly whose motivations are entirely cultural, not economic. Uh, I mean, I could, there's a whole bunch of evidence we could talk So I think it's perceptions of cultural threat that are actually driving uh, why immigrants are at the bottom of the deservingness judgment. So then the question is, what could we do? What could we do to reduce this sense of cultural threat and thereby reduce the propensity for immigrants to fall at the bottom of the deservingness judgments so that we could have an inclusive solidarity. So stylized, you could imagine two, two ways of trying to deal with this problem. One, which I think some Western European countries have adopted, is coercive civic integration policies. If immigrants aren't seen as complying with an ethic of community membership, we're going to force them to comply with an ethic of community membership. We're going to force them to take language classes, force them to take civics classes, uh, and that that will, that that will be a, a signal to the native-born uh, majority that we're forcing immigrants to, to comply with this ethic of community membership. So my view is that, this, that these, these heavy-handed paternalistic coercive civic integration problem, policies, they're first of all illegitimate, they're, they're coercive, and so they're, they're incompatible with certain fundamental liberal principles, so I think they're normatively wrong in principle, but more importantly, for this purposes, I think they're counterproductive, because when the state says to citizens, we need to make these programs, we need to make them mandatory, because if we didn't make them mandatory, immigrants of their own volition would not participate, contribute, reciprocate. That just confirms the belief or the perception on the part of citizens that immigrants are not willing, voluntary participants in an ethic of community membership. Uh, the very fact that the state makes it mandatory confirms people's hunch that immigrants are not of their own volition uh, interested in participating in an ethic of community membership. So I think we need to adopt another, the other approach, which, uh, which is uh, uh, multiculturalism, but multiculturalism conceived of in light of an ethic of community membership. That is, multiculturalism conceived of as a way for immigrants to express their membership in, participation in, loyalty to the larger society. And uh, if I was going to say one thing in defense of Canadian multiculturalism, I, that's, 
that's what I think Canadian multiculturalism has got right. I think Canadian multiculturalism has always been described, both to native-born citizens and to immigrants, as a form of membership, as a, as a, as a way of, of staking a claim in society and as a way of contributing to society. And even, dare I say it, as a form of nation building. There is, a, there is a long strand in Canada in which multiculturalism is conceived of as a nation building policy. And I think that, is helped to, that is, uh, helps to explain why support for welfare socialism is very, very low in Canada and why, why we have a, a, a more inclusive form of solidarity. But it's not unique to Canada. I would say the same thing about Australia. It's, multiculturalism is understood in the same way. And even in the UK. I think all that, that those are, I think are the most clear examples in my mind of a way in which multiculturalism has been presented uh, as a way for immigrants to express membership in, contribution to, participation in uh, the larger society. It's a form of multicultural citizenship. So, so this is my hunch, and it's just a hunch. My hunch is that the best, the most promising route to an inclusive solidarity is through a form of multiculturalism, but multiculturalism conceived of in relation to national solidarity and, and, and as, as a vehicle for immigrants to show their willingness to be part of an ethic of community membership. So that's basically all I want to say, but let me just end with two quick qualifications. So one is, I just want to repeat what I said before, this is highly speculative. We don't actually have good evidence about the extent to which solidarity is or is not needed for the welfare state. And we have even less evidence about what the impact of multiculturalism is on solidarity. So I'm just putting, I'm just stringing together bits, bits and pieces of evidence which I think are suggestive that uh, one promising route to an inclusive solidarity would be through a form of multicultural nationhood. I think we have some real world examples of it, but it's again, speculative, provisional, temporary. Even if that's right, and then I'll stop with this. Even if that's right, that that is a promising route to an inclusive solidarity, it just pushes the question back a level. What are the conditions that enables the development of that form of multicultural nationhood? And there, I, I, I will end with a, just a word of caution because it relates directly to the theme of this conference. I would say that part of what has made possible for Canada, Australia, and Britain to develop this kind of multicultural nationhood is that immigrants were seen as permanent settlers, who permanent residents and future citizens. Part of the logic of connecting multiculturalism to nationhood and viewing multiculturalism as a form of nation building, as a way of membership, was it's the assumption that they're here to stay, they and their children are here to stay, they are investing in society, we are investing in them, it makes sense for us, the society, to invest in them because they're going to be here for a long time, because they're future citizens, they're going to shape the society. So we're going to invest in them. It makes sense for them to invest in our society. And one of the ways in which they invest in our society, I don't mean invest in the financial sense, I mean socially. The way in which they socially invest in society is to build multicultural networks, multicultural organizations, associations, activities, and so on. So that, I think that assumption that immigrants are permanent, residents and future citizens has helped to make possible a form of multicultural nationhood. Now many people think, and, and it's interesting to note that in both Canada and Australia, temporary migrants, and we have temporary migrants, are not covered by the multiculturalism pro policies. So, and, and both Australia and Canada are currently undergoing kind of recent, uh, they're asking themselves, should, should we adopt a form of multiculturalism for our temporary migrants? But the reason they're asking is because the traditional form of multiculturalism was presupposed permanent immigrants. So that raises the question, I mean, some people think that the very distinction between temporary and permanent migrants is dissolving, that what we're, we're moving into a world in which there's just a kind of infinite complexity of legal statuses that are not purely temporary, not purely permanent, but, but are, have various levels of conditionality and, and precariousness and so on, and, and so that we, can't, we can no longer build public policies on the assumption of permanent settlement. Uh, it, it, I'm, so, the, you know, Vertivex super diversity is, is uh, one expression of that trend. So, I, 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 I'm not sure that the model I've just described works. If that really is the way in which we're going, I'm not sure that the model I've described works. I'm not sure that, I, I don't, I'm not sure that I find it particularly normally attractive to move to a world of uh, infinitely com complicated and conditional 
legal statuses. Uh, but in any event, I, um, I'm not sure what would sustain solidarity in such a world of, of liquid mobility. Okay, thanks.